ओए क्या हो रहा है बच्चे को हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी दिस इज धर्मेंद्र कुमार टेक्निकल असिस्टेंट एस आई सी डब्ल्यू परी मैम ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ स्टेट इंस्टीट्यूट हेल्थ एंड फैमिली वेलफेयर आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन दिस ट्रेनिंग सेशन आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट टू डॉक्टर हर्षरन कौर प्रिंसिपल ऑफ दिस इंस्टीट्यूट टू एड्रेस ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट हु आर अटेंडिंग दिस ट्रेनिंग सेशन सो सो आई इनवाइट मैम आई इनवाइट मैम टू एड्रेस गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी सो आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर टू डेज सेशन यू ऑल नो दैट ड्यूरिंग दिस सेकेंड वेव ऑफ कोविड नाइन्टीन रिएक्टिवेशन ऑफ केसेज आर देयर एंड द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ एंड फैमिली वेलफेयर हैजूड द गाइड लाइन रिगार्डिंग द ट्रीटमेंट so today we are going to talk about the home isolation uh, and uh, the care of the patient at home in mild and uh, asymptomatic cases so i welcome our mr sarkar from igmc from ordinary medicine so he will talk about today's topic home isolation and patient education thank you sir please thank you a uh, very good morning uh, so to, um, you know that we have around uh, 90% of the patient in himachal who are at present home isolated and um, proper monitoring of this patient is very important 
when the when you are sending someone to home you must educate the patient what are the things he or she needs to do and how to monitor himself or herself and when to report to the doctor who has been linked to the patient so uh, the proper monitoring of this patient important so that you can ship the patient to hospital as soon as the patient develops some red flag sign like for fall in the saturation or breathlessness or chest tightness or something else which will necessitates uh, admission in the hospital so the basic idea is proper guidance of the patient proper monitoring of the patient intense monitoring of the patient and to detect some uh, red flag signs so that there is no delay in shifting the patient to the hospital and moreover there recently we have the ministry guideline uh, dedicated to the care of the home isolated patient and we should also stick to the guideline that is equally important so so just two or three slides about the uh, sars cov 2 virus and the different stages of the in him lung involvement uh, before i uh, go into the actual topic the home isol management of the home isolated patient so the, you know that already you know that sars cov virus we have already a sars cov infection in the past there are some human corona virus also that can cause mild infection like upper respiratory tract infection and uh, they are uh, e e typically benign in nature but we have few uh, pandemic in the past also linked to the coronavirus like mars coronavirus like sars cov 1 uh, and now we we have the sars cov 2 but sars coronavirus 2 and the syndrome caused by this virus is called coronavirus disease 19 or covid 19 so this is the, the staging system proposed uh, uh, in this uh, in this review article and the author proposed three stages uh, you all know that initially we have the viral phase and followed by we have the pulmonary phase and then we have the inflammatory phase so in the viral phase uh, usually the patient presents with uh, constitutional symptoms like fever dry cough and then And then in the pulmonary phase which we divide into two types the 2a and 2b uh, 2a mean there is pulmonary involvement like patient having shortness of breath or coughing or purulent expectoration may or may not be there but there is a definite radiological involvement but the patient is not hypoxic and then stage 2b mean there is pulmonary involvement and the patient is hypoxemic but we are more concerned about the stage 3 also because this is the phase where the role of virus is less and body inflammation is more but it's the body's uh, dysregulated inflammatory response to the virus which leads to various organ damage in the body and may lead to multi organ failure including the respiratory failure so th this is the stage where most of the patient develop ards septic shock and multi organ failure so we are more concerned about this stage also so this this is the staging system and you can well understand that at different stages different medication would be effective like the viral phase you can use antiviral however beyond 10 days the antiviral will not be effective because the inflammatory phase usually begin after 10 days so that's why uh, the uh, yesterday i talked about remdesivir and that's why remdesivir or any other antiviral you should not give beyond 10 days if the patient uh, coming to you after 10 days after the onset of symptom there is no role of any antiviral drug at that point of time because the viral phase usually ends at that point of time now it is also important to know the modality of transmission of the covid virus because then only you can uh, tell the patient properly how to uh, follow various infectious prevention control measure so the most common modality of transmission is the droplet transmission when the patient speaks cough sneeze or laugh that time uh, respiratory droplets comes out from the respiratory tract 
and the droplet size is usually more than 10 micrometer and because it is bigger in size it does not remain the droplets do not remain suspended in the air for a pretty long time and they settle down within one or two um, the two meter from from the source and that's why if a, if a person is standing in front of the infected person and this and uh, not wearing any mask this droplet may enter into the airways and may cause may establish the infection into the susceptible person so if there are several modalities of transmission but the most accepted one is the droplet transmission and then wh also said that uh, airborne transmission can also occur uh, with uh, with the coronavirus infection which i will take up in, in the next slide so this is important to know the particle dyna aerodynamic diameter because it will guide it will tell you how far it can spread and what would be the modality of transmission as i have told you already the deep this is the source person who is coughing sneezing and the respiratory droplets will come out you can see most of the droplets they are bigger than 5 micrometer so they cannot travel beyond 1 meter usually 1 or 2 meter so if a susceptible person is standing close to the source person and not wearing any mask, the droplet may land inside the airways and may establish the infection. That is the most important modality of transmission. But there is other modalities also. Like this droplet may fall onto the nearby inanimate, inanimate objects like over the table, doorknobs, etc. And if the susceptible person touch the table or other objects onto which the droplet have settled down and then he touch his face or my, uh, touch his mouth, the infection may go inside. And that's why it is being told repeatedly that you don't touch your mask or don't touch your mouth and always keep uh, in a mask, always wear the mask when you are with pub, uh, in the public place, you please wear the mask. So you have now droplet transmission, you have the contact transmission. The contact transmission can be direct contact also, also or indirect contact. So far I talk about the indirect contact where the virus particles settle over the tabletop and you are touching the table. Now direct contact can happen when you handshake with the infected person and then you put your hand over your face and then direct contact may occur. But out of this, there is another modality of transmission and which has been shrouded in mystery since the beginning of this pandemic. Some people say, no, it's not possible to have aerosol transmission. By aerosol, I mean particle size, which is less than five micrometer in diameter. And since the particle size is smaller, this particle, they can travel to a longer distance, not only one meter. You cannot restrict this particle within one meter. It can travel inside the room, even can go into the corridor. So like you are nebulizing a patient and the nebulizer will create aerosol formation and the aerosol can travel to a long distance and can remain suspended and can infect the person. However, um, there has been controversy since the beginning, like CDC sometimes say it's not aerosol transmission, um, it's not a modality of transmission. Later on, they say aerosol, uh, different other bodies also say aerosol generating procedure, we must take precaution. Like you are nebulizing the patient, which will produce aerosol. So you must wear not only N95 masks, you should also use face seal, gowns, gloves, etc. and the head cover also. So this is important. What modality of transmission you are facing? If it is droplet, then washing your hands, wearing masks, and physical distancing is good enough. But if you are facing aerosol transmission, then you have to wear, that is possible only in the hospital setting when you are doing some aerosol generating procedure, for example, uh, like uh, CPR, intubation, nebulization, or oxygen therapy, you must take proper precaution. So now coming to who are the category of patient whom you will subject to home isolation. This is important to know. We have several categories of patient. I will 
go into the ministry guideline in the next few slides. So we have asymptomatic category here. How do you diagnose this patient? By lab investigation, for example, for contact tracing, when uh, one family member is infected, obviously you will do contact tracing of the other family member. And that time, though the person is asymptomatic, uh, his lab investigation showing RT-PCR positive. So they are called asymptomatic infection. And that's the, that is also the hallmark of this COVID-19 infection. Then you have mild category, and these two categories they, they constitute 81% patient. That's the good news. You know, majority of patients they will have mild category of infection, and so the burden on the healthcare system would be minimized. Um, so the, you, we, only these two category of patient you are supposed to advise home isolation. Then we have moderate 14, severe, and critical only 5%. In the critical category, uh, I mean those patients who had who had develop ARDS, multi-organ failures, in septic shock, or respiratory failure, they constitute the critically ill patient and the number is less 5%. How about taking into, if you consider the total number of COVID patients, we have active COVID patients in the country, this critical 5% of the critically ill patient will constitute a large burden on the healthcare system. So there are certain risk factor, you know, if they are present in the mild category of a patient, they will promote, they can, uh, you know, help, help in progression of the disease from mild to severe. That means any patient who are having any underlying comorbidity, which I have mentioned here, and the list are increasing every month. And you must be very, very vigilant. You should, your monitoring should be aggressive. You should tell the patient uh, because the um, threshold for shifting the patient to hospital should be minimal, should be lower if patient is having any one of these comorbid condition or the age is above 60 years. So the comorbid condition, there are two important points. Comorbid condition, they 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 are the high, they can they are the high risk factor for progression of disease from mild to severe. That is the first point. And if the patient with comorbid condition developing COVID infection, you see case fatality rate is very very high, right? So that's the that's the two reason why we should be very careful when we are uh, encounter uh, encountering patient of having comorbidity and also developing COVID infection. In our state, the main cause of death happening in the comorbid category and majority of the patient having diabetes, hypertension, or COPD. So uh, targeting this population and more aggressively. Is very, very, very important. Uh, one Oh, it is. Look at it. Yeah, right. Oh, right. Okay, banana. Look at it. Yeah, right. Oh, right. Okay, banana. 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 So, uh, so the point I want to highlight, please focus on the patient, particularly those patients who are having underlying comorbidity. <coughs> As I have told you, the threshold for shifting this patient should be lower. It should be kept low. So coming to the ministry guideline, so we have the three categories of patient, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild patient, they have only upper respiratory tract symptoms like sore throat, uh, sneeze, running nose, sneezing, or anosmia, change, um, change of the uh, alteration of the smell and taste. And there may, may not be fever, but definitely they will not have shortness of breath or they will their saturation would be normal. 
Now, moderate disease here, any one of these, respiratory rate can be high, above 24. Patient may be breathless. Um, SpO2 here would be lower than 94% cutoff. It will be varying from 90 to 93% on room air. Now, severe disease, uh, either the respiratory rate is above 30 per minute, patient would be breathlessness, saturation would be less than 90% on room air. So our focus for home isolation would be uh, mild patient, moderate disease, we have to admit uh, preferably in the DCHC, and the severe disease we have to admit in the DCH and particularly in the HDU or ICU. So this is the site of care decided according to the clinical, clinically assigned category of the patient done by the medical officer. So after the, after the publication of the AIMS guideline, to the, then after seven days later, uh, we have the ministry guideline to, on 28 April. And so the, the, I have already talked about who needs home isolation. That means the patient who are having mild or asymptomatic infection. I have also explained asymptomatic means lab confirmed patient who, the, the, who do not have any uh, sign symptoms of COVID infection and saturation level is maintaining, uh, which is above 94%. And mild patient mean only upper respiratory tract symptoms. There may may not be fever. Obviously, there won't be shortness of breath and saturation is perfectly okay, about 94%. So these two category of patient, you should focus for home isolation. Yes. So uh, what are the requirements for home isolation? Um, uh, first, there should be requisite facility at home for self-isolation. That, by that, I mean separate room, preferably separate toilet for the patient. And there should also be facility for quarantine the other family member also. So these things are important. Then only you can advise self-isolation self at home. And then there should be availability of caregiver on a 24 into 7 basis. And the caregiver will keep a communication, will establish a communication link between the patient and the hospital for the entire duration of the home isolation. Patients should also agree that he or she will monitor the health regularly and will inform the status to the physician link to the patient on a regular basis. That is very important. And the patient should feel He'll feel in the undertaking that he will undertake self-isolation and will follow all the guidelines and will, will uh, strictly follow the guidelines religiously. That's very important. So you must have facility for home isolation at home. There should be availability of caregiver. That's very important. There should be a link between a medical officer and the patient. The patient should take undertaking that he will inform the physician on a regular basis. So these are important points that you must remember. Now, what we will do if the patient is elderly patient above 60 or patient having some comorbid condition like hypertension, diabetes, <laughs> heart disease, or any other chronic lung, liver, kidney disease, or cerebrovascular disease. So ideally, ideally this category of patient should be subjected to hospital admission, preferably DCH, DCCC, if the patient's saturation is maintained and no breathlessness. However, if the patient wants to remain home isolated, then the decision should be taken by the physician after examining the patient. And you have to look whether the underlying comorbidity is controlled or not. That's very important. The comorbidity must be controlled and then you, can, you may allow the patient to undergo home isolation. Similarly, anybody who is having immunocompromised condition like HIV, transplant recipient, cancer therapy, you have to assess the patient. You have to says, find out which, where it will be safe to keep the patient, home isolation or triple C. And then you can take a uh, you know, decision on that. So because the comorbid group is important, as I have told you, they may progress to the severe or moderate category disease. And moreover, if they develop a moderate or severe category infection, and if they develop um, the COVID, the CFR increases. So we have to focus definitely on this category of patient. Now, though the guide, 
national guideline is stick to hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis for the for the family members having contact with the positive patient however the evidences are uh, not very supportive some evidences are there icmr study and im study uh, have found beneficial effects however the larger randomized controlled trial published in negm didn't find any pro benefits of prophylaxis however we should stick to the national guideline and we may advise hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis to the family members and the dosing schedule i will tell you later on so uh, what you should tell the patient the you should tell the patient that you should uh, stay in a well ventilated <coughs> single room having a test or separate toilet that is the preferable one not always you will find that kind of room uh, you have to take a holistic de decision uh, if, uh, if regarding that if a family member needs to wants to stay in the same room ideally you should not allow anyone to stay in the same room how about uh, if he or she insisted on doing that then you, there should be a 1 meter gap between the two sometimes the pay, you may have two or three patient in the same uh, same room uh, in the same house and then the because they are of the, of the same type of cohort all are covid positive that time we may allow but ideally we should not allow so the patient we should tell the patient strictly that you should keep stay as you should keep isolated particularly from elderly people household member pregnant women children in the household or any person in the household who are having some comorbid condition patient should restrict his or her movement within the house that's very important under no circumstances patient should attend any social gatherings and so all these things we have to tell the patient before the patient go to the home isolation otherwise uh, there would be violation of the home isolation patient may come out of the house may attend social gathering so we must tell the patient clearly so what are the things he or she needs to do or not to do that's very important so what mask the patient should wear all the time patient should wear mask that's the first point he should wear triple layer mask medical mask i mean how long he or she should uh, uh, wear the mask he or she should wear the mask uh, for uh, says at least 8 hours after that you need to discard the mask that's important now how to discard the mask that is also important and we have to follow the infection control practices uh, guideline strictly uh, if the mask gets visibly wet or soil before 8 hours the patient must discard the mask immediately at that point of time uh, if a, if the caregiver wants to enter the room to provide some food or for some other purpose both the patient and the caregiver must wear in 95 mask otherwise they can uh, they should wear triple layer surgical mask that's good enough for that now mask should be discarded only after disinfecting it with 1% sodium hypochlorite or bleaching powder patient should keep it in his uh, room and he should disinfect the mask properly and then he or she should put it inside the paper basket patient must take enough rest and must consume lots of water that is important to maintain hydration so now uh, you should also tell the patient to follow respiratory etiquette all time you should uh, tell the patient how to cough How, when, then how to discard the paper tissue paper he is putting it over his mouth and uh, all these things basic respiratory etiquette you must tell the patient all the time you should tell the patient to wash the hands frequently but there is one difference compared <coughs> to the previous guideline where it was 20 second now in this guideline you have to wash the hands with soap and water preferably for 40 40 second at least or if or otherwise you can use alcohol based sanitizer like 70% isopropyl alcohol but uh, the simplest one would be soap and water and how long 40 second don't share personal item patient should not share personal items with other household members patient should clean the surfaces in his room that are open touch upon like table tops door knobs handles he can use 1% hypochlorite solution or if available even alcohol based solution can be used for that he should 
self monitor oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter as per guideline and the frequency i will tell you so now coming to what to do uh, what to advise uh, uh, the caregiver that's the important point caregiver should wear triple layer medical mask all the time whenever he or she will enter the room of the patient both the patient and the caregiver should wear in 95 mask the the caregiver should be told that please don't touch the front part of the mask and if the mask gets wet or dirty with secretion he should change it immediately and patient should after discarding the mask the caregiver should follow the um, ipc practice that is hand hygiene uh, after uh, removing the mask he or she should avoid touching own face nose or mouth and that's a common mistake most of us do so that you must tell the patient and the caregiver equally what not to do and what to do acha <clears throat> hand hygiene must be ensured that's important after contact with patient and immediate environment uh, before wearing and after removing mask i mean about the caregiver after entering the patient's room and after coming out the pay, the hand hygiene patient should under the caregiver should follow hand hygiene and before wearing and after removing mask the caregiver should follow hand hygiene before and after uh, preparing food the caregiver should follow hand hygiene um, so these these are the things you should tell the pay, pay caregiver also and how, how to do hand hygiene i have already told you repeating again use soap and water for at least 40 seconds otherwise you have alcohol based hand rubs uh, if hands are not visibly soiled if the hands are visibly soiled you cannot use hand sanitizer you have to use soap and water that's important after using soap and water use of this use of disposable paper here mute kar do after was using soap and water preferably use disposable paper towels to dry hands if not available you can use a dedicated clean clothes towels and replace them when they become wet so um, uh, another few more instruction to the caregiver after direct contact with the patient secretion uh, use uh, avoid direct contact with the patient secretion that's important and use disposable gloves also avoid exposure to potentially contaminated items in in the patient's immediate surroundings like uh, utensils dishes drinks uh, etc food must be provided to the patient in his own room in the patient's room utensil and dishes that are used by the patient should be clean with soap and detergent and then water wearing gloves that's important and the same utensil and dishes may be reused so these are the question you will be faced that's why you should have clear idea uh, how, how to uh, what type of utensil should be used how to clean the utensil should be use uh, reuse it or not that's are all important clean hands after taking off gloves or handling used items use triple layer medical mask and disposable gloves while cleaning or handling surfaces clothing or linen used by the patient perform hand hygiene before and after removing gloves so every step is important now coming to the monitoring chart so national guidelines suggesting that you you should tell the patient to monitor every 4 hourly the day of onset of symptom the patient must mention the day of onset of symptom and timing that is important because the duration of isolation will depend on the day of onset of symptoms you have patient you should tell the patient to monitor temperature heart rate that you will get from pulse oximeter saturation from pulse oximeter and uh, you should tell the patient to inform you whether what uh, wh what type of feeling the patient having uh, uh, is does he feel better or same or worse than the previous day that is important if the patient saying i'm feeling worse than the previous day that's this uh, that's the point of time when you should assess the requirement of hospitalization similarly regarding the breathlessness status you should uh, tell the patient how he is 
Aussie is feeling about the breathlessness? Is it better than the previous day or the same or worse? Anything which is worse than the previous day, you have to be cautious and you have to take uh, necessary action accordingly. If the patient's feeling more breathlessness, you have to hospitalize the patient. If the saturation falling below the cutoff, normal cutoff, you have to hospitalize the patient. So these are important points. So how to see the pulse oximeter reading is important. You should tell the patient to wait in the room for at least five minutes. If the patient coming from toilet, tell the patient to wait first, uh, take a rest for five minutes. That's important. And then patient should find out whether the hands are cold or not. Then he should make his hands warm, right? That's the second important point. If there is um, a nail polish or false nail, the patient should remove that. Uh, you should use one finger. You should use one pulse oximeter. It is not wise to put a several pulse oximeter and to see the reading. And different the patient will get different reading and it will cause anxiety. You should keep the hands at the heart level. That's important. Keep the hands stable. And then you put the pulse oximeter in the middle finger of the right hand. Uh, so this is the way you should advise the patient. And you should wait a few minutes before the pulse waves get stabilized, and then you take the maximum reading. So please remember this, and you should tell the patient how to measure pulse oximeter uh, saturation by pulse oximeter. Because lots of time you will get a panic call because the patient is not measuring the saturation properly, not following the proper instruction. So if the hands are cold, if there is nail polish, you are bound to get low pulse saturation. So that's why you have to take into consideration all these points. So another test that you should advise the patient at home isolation, home in home care isolated patient is a six minute walk test. You should tell the patient to measure um, oxygen saturation before undergoing six minute, uh, six minute uh, walk test. Uh, but the saturation level must be above 94% then only you should advise the patient to undergo this testing. Uh, if the saturation is already less than 94, please don't advise six minute walk test. Now, after walking six minutes, patient may walk at his own space. You should you find measure, the, you tell the patient to measure saturation again. If the saturation falls below 94% on room air, or there is a 3% fall from baseline after six minute walk test, the patient should consult physician. That's important. Another test that you should advise the patient is the breath holding test. You should tell the patient to uh, hold breath. After taking deep inhalation, the patient should hold the breath and then go on counting and you see how far he can count. If he can count beyond 30, that's pretty good. That his lung, tongue, lung power is okay. That is muscle power is okay, respiratory muscle power. So these are two tests that you can advise in home isolated patients. Six minute work test and um, six minute work test. And um, the, the second one is, uh, breath holding test. So both are important. Just well, so coming to the treatment part, the <coughs> national guide aims ICMR guideline advocating ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine for the home isolated patient. And there is no mention of flavipiravir. And so please don't advise flavipiravir to the home isolated patient or any COVID-19 patient. Flavipiravir, the evidences are very, very weak. It was initially meant for use in Japan for influenza patient. However, the study regarding its impact on COVID-19 patient, the quality of study are lacking. So please don't advise flabipiravir to any home isolated or COVID-19 patient in the state. So this is the AIMS guideline. The dosing schedule is different. What we are following. So ivermectin 200 microgram per kg once a day for three days. And you should, you should tell the patient to avoid it in pregnancy and lactating women because uh, the safety is still not known. 
and if uh, ivermectin uh, is not available there or if you would you want to prescribe some there is some hypersensitivity to ivermectin then you can prescribe hydroxychloroquine which is a repurpose drug just like ivermectin they are meant for some other purpose uh, or now now they are being used uh, repurposed for covid 19 infection However, um, the, hydro, the first preference should be given to ivermectin because the quality evidence are stronger with that. Then you should, second choice should be hydroxychloroquine, 400 mg BD for one day, followed by 400 mg OD for four days, unless contraindicated. One important contraindication can be prolonged QTC uh, or uncontrolled arrhythmia in your patient. So uh, patients should follow symptomatic management for fever, running nose and cough as advised by the treating medical officer. For fever, you should advise paracetamol, 650 mg SOS. But if the patient having persistent fever, you can go maximally four times a day. That is 650 mg four times a day. But if your patient saying that I am having fever despite taking paracetamol 650 mg four times a day, you may switch over to the stronger NSAID that is uh, naproxen. And the dose is the 250 mg uh, twice a day. So if the patient fever does not subside after taking paracetamol 650 mg four times a day, you should switch over to naproxen 250 mg twice a day. Why? Because it is a stronger and anti-inflammatory drug. So patient, this is important. There should be all 24 into seven communication between the patient and caregiver and patient should report immediately if there is any deterioration noted by him. Patients should continue the medication meant for other comorbid condition. For example, if the patient is taking um, AC inhibitor or telmisatran for BP control, don't stop telmisatran. Patients should continue taking telmisatran. If the patient is taking inhaled corticosteroid for asthma, please don't stop inhaled corticosteroid. Let it be continued. Otherwise, there may be asthma attack, precipitation of asthma attack. You may advise the patient to perform warm water gargles or take steam inhalation twice a day. Adequate hydration and rest is important. Uh, patients may take oral rehydration solution when during febrile period just to avoid hydration and electrolytic imbalance. For dry, most of the time, patients complain of dry cough, and then you may advise antitussive. We have two, three antitussive, the dextromethorphan, levodopropagine. You may advise stay enabled twice a day or thrice a day, depending on the requirement. Now coming to the antiviral and the, uh, and the dosing schedule, we are advising in the state and you should follow this dosing schedule only. Tap ivermectin 12 mg twice a day. Um, there are reports from the Google, in the Google, you will find that it should be taken empty stomach at least 30 minutes before or two hours after food. And there are also some few publications in the PubMed which suggest that if you take this medicine with fatty meal, it will increase the absorption. That's important. So fatty meal, I mean, if the patient may take the drug with a half glass milk or butter, so that will increase absorption of the drug. So you can follow either of them and they both are available in the apartments and that's why I have put up both the, both the modality of taking the medication. We always, we should take ivermectin with doxycycline and doxycycline dose 200 mg stat on day one, then 100 BD from day two to day five. Why we are using doxycycline? It is not as an antibiotic, but as an anti-inflammatory drugs. And it has been found doxycycline um, uh, uh, in reduces inflammation within the cell, intercellular, within a cell. And that's important in for controlling COVID proliferation also. Doxycycline, ivermectin um, is a pregnancy category C, you should better avoid it in pregnant and lactating mother. Azithromycin may increase the serum level, may cause side effects. Concomitant alcohol can also increase severity of adverse effects. So ivermectin may be given in mild COVID-19 infection. It is not approved by FDA USA for any viral infection, but there are other guidelines also which are promoting it and we should use as per our national guideline. It inhibits the, how does it function? It inhibits the host 
alpha 1 beta 1 nuclear transport protein which transport the transport the virus from extracellular into intercellular organ uh, interferes with attachment of the virus with the host cell membrane that is ac2 receptor and immunomodulatory action in renal impairment no dosing adjustment in hepatic impairment no adjustment pregnancy and breastfeeding not routinely indicated so there are certain side effects you must know that in the dermatological pruritus rash even arthralgia synovitis tachycardia edema also there nausea diarrhea there can be transaminitis ivermectin may enhance anticoagulant effects of vitamin k agonist for example warfarin so you should keep that point in mind uh so coming to the another new addition in the national guideline that is inhaled budesonide now this drug you can advise either by meter dose inhaler or dry powder inhaler the dosing of budesonide is pretty high that is 800 microgram twice a day for 5 days uh, when to be given the if the, your patient at ho, who is who are home isolated complaining that i am having fever and or cough which is persistent beyond 5 days of disease onset that's the time when you should advise inhaled budesonide um, so you should tell the patient to rinse mouth after using inhaled budesonide to avoid local and systemic side effects so dosing is 800 microgram it's available 200 or 400 microgram accordingly you have to tell the patient so if a patient saying that on the, the, i am having fever on day 6 my saturation is okay but my fever is persisting or my cough is persisting and today is day sick and still i am having fever or cough that the point of time when you should advise inhale budesonide there would be symptomatic improvement how long you have to give 5 days now obviously the question will arise why you are not giving it from the day 1 the answer is because it's a steroid it may pro promote viral proliferation and so that's that's the point you should keep in mind so don't advise it within the first 5 days you advise it if you have to advise you advise it after 5 days only according to the guideline laid down by the ministry other non specific drug there are benefits uh, there are studies for and against but there is no, uh, no there is uh, you should not be very you very using this drug because they are benign drug zinc 50 mg od vitamin c 500 bd you may advise once a day also you may advise vitamin d uh, 60000 international unit once a week for 3 weeks you should not routinely advise antibiotic that's the very unscientific to advise antibiotic to all fever is a viral fever until unless there is some evidence of infection don't advise antibiotics uh, it will promote the development of drug resistant multi drug resistant bacteria in the community in the society and that will prove detrimental in the future so uh, as i have told you the, the uh, Bud, bud, this is one trial of budesonide in this trial they have started using budesonide from the beginning is a phase 2 trial but i have given you the reason why it should not be used in the first 5 days where the viral proliferation may get promoted and that may prove detrimental to the patient in this trial they have found significant symptomatic benefit after using budesonide however you should use it only after 5 days so should you use oral steroid in home isolated patient routinely big no don't advise steroid to all patient particularly within the first 7 days where the viral phase is going on that can prove detrimental to the patient so please don't advise steroid routinely to all patient uh, patient only patient who are having persistent fever or uh, what's any fever and which is persisting uh, beyond 7 days the local the doctor uh, after can take a decision for uh, adopt for using low dose oral steroid which steroid i'm coming in the next slide should we use remdesivir or other to uh, investigational therapy like tocilizumab at home care answer is big no some people they are purchasing it they are keeping it at home and that's not uh, so that's not correct 
you should tell the patient not to procure or administer or you should not administer remdesivir at home it is it is to be administered only in the hospital setting if your patient say uh, patient develop hypoxemia on home care and patient say i will not go to hospital i will keep oxygen i have oxygen cylinder i will use it at home and then you please administer remdesivir answer is big no it may produce side effect so it has to be given only in the hospital setting in the previous day i talked about the remdesivir induced bradycardia so some that's why there are other side effects also which may prove detrimental to the patient so please don't advise remdesivir administration in the home setting only in the hospital setting so the point i have made clear that compared to the last guideline we have one different that is oral steroids you may advise not right and left not routinely only in patient who are having persistent fever and and coughing and beyond 7 days then you may take a decision to start low dose steroid for a shorter period of time so this is the anti inflammatory potential of various steroid we are advising as per guideline uh, only um, only dexamethasone and methylprednisolone as per our national guideline you see the anti inflammatory potential of dexa is much much higher 25 compared to pen methylped 5 and pen for you see the duration of action is 36 to 72 hours and so please don't um, advise this medis dexamethasone twice a day dosing there is no scientific basis you have to use once a day dosing 6 mg is good enough low dose methylprednisolone the equivalent dose is 32 mg equivalent to 6 mg you have to give it twice a day 16 mg you may give it 16 mg bid because the it's a intermediate acting 12 hours so that's why uh, you should give methylprednisolone 16 mg bid rather than 32 mg od so these are the two steroid usually advised in home isolated patient by our national guideline but only after 7 day if patient having fever persistent fever worsening fever and cough then only you should advise this medication so uh, you should be careful because now we now we are getting so many case report from our country like orbital mycormycosis candida oris and this is happening because uh, so many patient getting steroid some with indication some without indication some getting more than the recommended dose very very high dose dose very very uh, even double dose of tocilizumab and all these are causing as making a susceptible population in the country and that's why we are support we are bound to get lots of fungal infection in the near future and which is happening now so be careful choose the medication and the dosing schedule as recommended by the national guideline don't deviate from the guideline uh, out of panic that's very very important so when to advise the patient for i stopping the home isolation and shifting the patient to um, um, hospital for hospital that's very important you have to take decision at the earliest the moment the patient develops any red red flag sign you should tell the patient to um, shift the you have to tell shift the patient immediately if the patient needs oxygen for shifting please uh, uh, advise the patient to shift with a oxygenated ambulance not uh, in his own car uh, that's very very important otherwise patient may, patient even patient life would be at risk if you shift the hypoxemic patient without proper shifting method without oxygenated ambulance that may prove fatal to the patient so these are the four things you must remember difficulty in breathing you must shift the patient to hospital deep in the saturation level normal cut off uh, i have told you 94% on room air below that you have to shift the patient persistent pain or pressure in the chest you have to shift the patient mental confusion or inability to arouse you have to immediately shift the patient so take proper care while shifting the patient to hospital now when you will discontinue home isolation the new guideline there is some change uh, previously it was 17 days now it is 10 days at least 10 days have passed from the date of onset of symptom if your patient is asymptomatic 10 from the date of sampling you have to count 
10 days from the date of sampling or date of onset of symptoms, provided there is no fever in the last three days. If the patient say, I'm having fever till day nine, then you, you should discontinue isolation or take three days after that, day 10, day 11, day 12. So after day 12, you should stop isolation. Let me tell you, strongly advise that you don't need any retesting before you discontinue home isolation. So as per our national guideline, we should not advise retesting of our patient to you know, further discontinue home isolation because there are scientific basis for that. We have lots of study which has suggested that viral um, you know, patient remain infectious for eight days. After eight days, patient usually become non-infectious. And that's why national guideline uh, had adopted that policy that 10 days is good enough to discontinue, to discontinue home isolation of the patient. So I have talked about the uh, use of uh, hydroxychloroquine in the family member of the home isolated patient. Uh, so asymptomatic household contact of lab confirmed patient, you should, the dosing is different. 400 twice a day on day one, followed by 400 mg every week for next three weeks. And this medication to be taken with milk. And now in case of healthcare worker or frontline worker, you see the dosing schedule is up to seven weeks. That's the difference. For the family member, household asymptomatic household contact, it is three weeks. And for the healthcare worker or frontline worker, it is seven weeks. After seven weeks, if you want to, the, if the patient, if the healthcare worker or frontline worker want to continue it, he or she can do it only after consulting the doctor and after proper clinical and ECG parameter evaluation. That's important. So you should always tell the patient, you know, COVID has created lots of anxiety and panic among the infected person. So that's the important, that's where your role will start, not only advising medication, not only educating the patient how to adopt the proper infection prevention control practices, but you should also tell the patient, uh, you should also encourage the patient to keep a positive frame of mind that is equally important. So awake proning is very important that you can advise in a home isolated patient also, particularly when the saturation is dipping below 94%. This is the uh, picture taken from GOI side, Government of India side. You see the pillow, where to keep the pillow, one below the neck, one below the leg, and another below the abdomen. And patient should change the position. This is the prone position. You see if the patient has to take the chips, has to adopt various positions. Every position patient should remain for 30 minutes to two hours, like in the prone position, like in the right, lateral, right, left lateral decubitus, right lateral decubitus, uh, prone, supine or sitting posture. You have to change this posture every 30 to two minutes, two hours. Uh, avoid proning for an hour after meal. If the patient uh, ha, ha, had taken meal, at least avoid proning for one hour after that. Maintain proning for as much as possible. Uh, one may prone for up to 16 hours, depending on the comfort level he or she can feel. Uh, you, pillows must be adjusted slide to alter the pressure areas. That's very important. You should avoid bed sore also. Uh, that's the important point. You should avoid proning in the following condition, uh, pregnancy, but uh, there are other guidelines suggesting that I'll, which first trimester may advise. Uh, may, so this is taken from the GI guideline. Deep vein thrombosis uh, treated in less than 48 hours, you should avoid that. Major cardiac condition, uh, uh, in the, uh, uncontrolled hemodynamic, unstable, spine fracture, you should avoid this. Unstable uh, femur or pelvic fracture, don't advise prawning in this patient. So this is another device you may advise to your patient in sentence pyrometry, particularly in the post-rehabilitation, post-COVID rehabilitation. Patient, if possible, you should tell the patient to do this exercise five minutes uh, in five minutes, but two times in a day, uh, taking into consideration patient's energy level and all other things. Uh, 
So you may advise this uh, device to your patient in sentence pyrometer for a lung, exer a lung exercise. Uh, now giving you some case scenario, if you can uh, you can send me the answer in the chatting or you can uh, uh, in the chat box. A 55 year old man, right? I uh, have tested positive for COVID. After his son uh, became sick and detected positive, his son had to be hospitalized. That means he is having moderate to severe disease. But the uh, 55 year old man, uh, he is not having any symptom. He is asymptomatic. His 51 year old wife and 20 year old daughter have tested negative. At, uh, they tested negative. They live in a two room flat where one room has an attached toilet and there is no other toilet in that flat, will you advise home isolation for this person? You can answer, you can send me in the chat box also. So only one toilet and household member, they are not infected. Um, Ideally, single toilet, we should not advise home isolation, ideally, right? But if the patient, you know, um, patient does not want to be hospitalized, you don't have any other option, then you should tell the patient and the caregiver how to, uh, de de you, how to sanitize the toilet, how, what, what should be the timing uh, after the a patient entered the toilet, what should be the timing? Okay. Uh -huh. Right, uh, is, uh, you should not advise home isolation. Well, all of you correctly answer. Okay, next. So there is no provision for two separate toilets in the flat. The man should not be advised home isolation and uh, should be hospitalized. A 40-year-old man, who uh, an office employee and post-renal transplant, that is important. He is under immunosuppressive therapy. You can understand post-renal transplant, but he will be on several under several immunosuppressive therapy. He has developed his four days history of fever, and three days history of cough. He developed shortness of breath since last one day and his saturation has dipped to 92%, right? He lives in a one bedroom house with wife and one child. Will you advise home isolation for this man? And you please answer in the chat box. No, we will advise. No, last me chalo. Last me chalo. I can see few, most of the people have written no. Definitely they are correct. And one uh, written yes. So it, it should be no, right? How can you advise? First of all, the patient having underlying comorbidity, right? And in our state, we have seen that patient post renal transplant, the prognosis is not very good if they acquire the infection, I mean, COVID infection, right? So, uh, and moreover, uh, one bedroom. So ideally, post-renal transplant patient, uh, they are at high risk of progression into severe disease. Secondly, the patient is patient is hypoxemic. His oxygen saturation is 92%. It is below 94, cut off. So he is having moderate COVID. So this is the time you should hospitalize the patient at the earliest. So you should not advise home isolation to this patient. One, he is having risk factor for progression into severe disease. Secondly, he, uh, he, the prognosis would be poor in a comorbid patient. Third, he is having moderate COVID. The saturation has dipped. And so you should advise hospital isolation. So uh, there are certain challenges you may face in home isolated patient. That is one is availability of space. 
that's important. You may not get a separate toilet everywhere. Uh, the secondly, supportive caregiver. You may not have the parts, the caregiver may be elderly, having comorbid condition and not in a proper health uh, to take care of the patient. Close monitoring at home, that may be issue sometimes. Availability of equipments, I mean pulse oximeter. Timely recognition of deterioration and hospitalization. This is the most important line that I want to highlight. Please take care of the patient. Keep a, tell the patient to inform the doctor uh, linked to the patient immediately once he or she develops some fall in the saturation or breathlessness. And you should guide the patient how to ship the patient to hospital, taking proper care that will not put the patient life in jeopardy. Uh, if the patient needs oxygen before shifting, to higher center, you must tell the patient to get shifted in an oxygenated ambulance. That's very, very important. So thank you very much. And if you have any question, please ask me in the chat box. Uh, can we? So one question is: Can we give defla 